Dear colleagues, dear friends, it is my great pleasure to welcome you all to the first webinar in the webinar series we're calling Warm Up to UNEA 5.2 towards the decision to launch negotiations for a new global agreement on plastic pollution. This series is hosted by Grid Arndal and the Norwegian Ministry of Climate and Environment. My name is Ingeborg Murknudsen and I represent the Norwegian Ministry of Climate and Environment. And let me also express my sincere thanks to colleagues at GRID for organizing and setting up these events. This series will start today on December 8th and run until 15th of February 2022. And you can find more information about the series on the marinelitterhub.com website. I believe this will be shared in the chat box for uh, colleagues and friends to uh, consult during today's webinar. And the purpose of this webinar is to create an informal virtual meeting space where we will have an opportunity to start the discussions and warm up for the negotiations that will take place at UNIA 5.2 next February on plastic pollution. It is our ambition that we will address several issues that are relevant for the draft resolution to be negotiated at UNIA 5.2. And we have currently planned for six webinars in total that in short will address today we have the scope and global goals. On 16th of December, we will have the national action plans. On 13th of January next year, we will discuss the role of the UN system. 27th of February, sorry, January, we will discuss sustainability criteria. On the 3rd of February, financial mechanisms. And the final event before UNEA will address recycling myths and life cycle measures. Just a few uh, housing rules before we start. This webinar will be recorded and made available on the website I just quoted, the marinelitterhub.com, where you can find all the webinars in this series, as well as the Nordic reports on a new global agreement and other resources. So I encourage all of you to consult this website hosted by Grid Arndal. Hopefully we will have time for some questions after the presentation by our speakers today. So feel free to use the chat function to post your questions. And now over to the topic for today's event. Marine plastic litter, marine debris, marine plastic pollution, ocean plastic pollution. Many terms have been used when we discuss the scope of a new global agreement. But the question we have before us today is really what is the problem that we want to tackle? And are these really different or similar names and terms for the same problem? Are there differences in terms of solutions that are needed or not really? These are very big and uh, central questions when we speak of the scope of a new global agreement to make sure that it becomes an effective and ambitious tool. And the webinar today will provide an opportunity to discuss issues related to the scope of a new global agreement and the links that we have to what will be our global goals and ambitions. So to address these very relevant questions today, we have invited a few selected guest speakers. First one is Dr. Karen Raubenheimer from the University of Wollongong in Australia. Then we have Celia Rem, a senior advisor at the Norwegian Environment Agency, and Eirik Lindebjerg from WWF, and Ambrogio Misrochi from the Ellen MacArthur Foundation. So I will start off by pointing out a few uh, questions that I hope that you will address in your presentation. And uh, first out is uh, Karen who is a professor at the Wollongong University and the lead author on uh, notably many UNEP reports related to issues like marine litter, plastics pollution, and uh, uh, notably also on the Nordic report on possible elements of a new global agreement to prevent plastic pollution. And looking back, uh, Karen, our understanding of this issue has grown from being mostly a marine related issue where plastic pollution in our ocean and on our beaches was our key concern, growing into a more uh, systemic issue that needs to be addressed across the whole life cycle of uh, plastics. And this is something that you developed in the first Nordic report on elements in a new global agreement that was launched, uh, it's almost a year ago already. And in the report, you argue that in order to be an effective agreement, we need to address plastic pollution as a whole. So why don't you tell me and us a bit more about this? Karen, you have the floor, please. OK, thank you. So just uh, sharing a little presentation to support um, my talk today. So good day to everyone. It's, it's really a pleasure to, to be here um, and to start the discussion around the language associated with the issue as, as Ingeborg has introduced. 
and potentially what that could mean for the title and scope of a new agreement, as well as the objectives and goals. So globally, there's been a progression in the understanding of the issue of plastic pollution. First, there was a shift in focus from sea-based sources towards land-based sources. Second, the focus broadened again from downstream to upstream activities, moving beyond uh, waste management and cleanups. And then third, as science revealed more sources and pathways, the focus broadened again from oceans to all environmental compartments, uh, including freshwater, soil, and atmosphere. And then lastly, the focus has now also broadened from environmental considerations to include socioeconomic dimensions, particularly for poverty eradication and job creation, empowering informal waste pickers and improving health. So these developments must be taken into account when designing a new global agreement. The language used has also changed over the years and Ingeborg has mentioned some here. In 2015, SDG 14.1 referred to marine debris the first resolution adopted at UNIA 1 referred to marine plastic debris and microplastics. And then marine litter and microplastics was used in the resolutions adopted at UNIA 2, 3, and 4. We also had a resolution adopted at UNIA 4 on single use plastic products pollution. And the two new draft resolutions put forward for UNIA 5 used the terms plastic pollution and marine plastic pollution. And UNEP, as we know, is increasingly using the terms marine litter and plastic pollution. So one consideration to raise in future discussions is, is the clarification on whether the term plastic pollution includes pollution by associated chemicals, or do we need to include a term similar to plastic related pollution to encompass all pollution associated with the life cycle. So a few considerations there around the language that we've been using. But why does this matter? Um, it will come down to the language included in the agreement uh, in the text of the agreement, but we need to be clear on what the objective of the agreement should be. The first option could be to target a reduction of marine litter. Here, the regional seas programs play an important role in advancing research, awareness raising, education and monitoring of marine litter and cleanup efforts. However, it's relevant to ask if the regional seas can develop a life cycle approach to plastics. There are also uh, geographical gaps, which means these frame this framework may present challenges in establishing a comprehensive global approach. The second option could be an agreement that moves on one step upstream to promote sustainable waste management through the waste hierarchy of reduce, reuse and recycle that we know so well. This may present limitations in addressing source materials and the design of products across the global value chain. And then the third option for a global agreement is to move completely upstream to the source and focus on sustainable production consumption of plastics. This would focus on the design of plastic products and would inherently facilitate the first and second options of sustainable waste management and ultimately a reduction of marine litter. The third option would also allow us to better tackle the contribution of plastics to climate change and the extraction of natural resources, as we've seen in the latest report by UNEP on the triple planetary crisis. Historically, we focused on plastic pollution in the marine environment. This is where most of our knowledge has been built up as well as our monitoring programs. If the new agreement targets only the pollution caused by plastics, the agreement could focus on remediating the leakage of residual wastes across the life cycle, uh, targeting the monitoring of impacts in all environmental compartments, removal of plastics from all environmental compartments, and the appropriate disposal of those wastes collected. A stronger focus on the end of life phase of plastics could encompass environmentally sound waste management through measures to prevent the generation of wastes and mitigation of those wastes and also target a reduction in residual chemicals. The new agreement would need to consider developments under the Basel Convention and could complement the Basel Convention in targeting global improvements for collection, sorting and transport of end of life plastics. But if we're going to achieve the life cycle approach, or a circular economy or a holistic and systemic approach, as we've heard calls for in numerous resolutions, declarations and statements, the agreement is going to have to be very strong in driving action at the production and consumption phases. This is the value add of a new global agreement over the framework that we currently have in place. The agreement needs to, be comp needs to complement efforts under the Basel Convention as mentioned to bring resources back to the production phase 
so that we can increase the supply of recycled materials and reduce extraction and manufacturing rates, as well as use um, less harmful chemicals. Consumption must target not just end users, but all commercial consumers across the value chain and promote a reduction in the number of products consumed that don't meet sustainability criteria, while increasing reuse systems and also reducing abrasion that leads to microplastics entering the environment. If we look at the global targets we currently have in place, there is a strong focus on the marine environment, uh, which is highlighted here in red. We should look to the language in the Ocean Plastics Charter as an example, highlighted here in green, which uses terminology that promotes a holistic and systemic approach to the issue. So just some considerations around the language we have been using and what we could be moving towards. And finally, there are a number of SDGs that this agreement could help deliver on if designed correctly. So we need to um, solidly move forward from SDG 14.1 and 14.2 on, on marine restoration. And move towards some of the other SDGs that talk more about um, hazardous chemicals, water quality and wastewater as regards marine or microplastics, consumption and production, air quality, and, and definitely the life cycle of chemicals and waste, as well as reducing waste um, generation. So to finish, I would like to also acknowledge my co-author of the Nordic Report, Nico Oro, and I thank you for listening and look forward to discussions. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Karen, for sharing that uh, kickoff presentation today and uh, highlighting some very important elements that we definitely need to consider as we move forward with our plannings for the negotiations, but also in developing the actual content of the new global agreement. I will now uh, turn to our next speaker, my colleague uh, Celia Rem, who is a senior advisor at the Norwegian Environment Agency. And Celia works on policies related to plastics and plastic waste and has a special focus on international cooperation. And the agency provides advice to us at the ministry on elements that could be considered a new global agreement. So um, Celia, in uh, Norway, we have recently launched a revised plastic strategy. And I know that you at the agency have also done some things into how to understand these differences that uh, we are addressing in today's webinar. So I hope that you will share some of that thinking with us. Celia, you have the floor. Thank you very much. I hope you can both hear me and uh, see the presentation by now. Yeah. Um, I'll just dive right into it. <laughs> because at the very first United Nations Environment Assembly back in 2014, the resolution Marine Plastic Debris and Microplastics was adopted. It was, as Karen pointed out, this ocean framing, um, within this ocean framing that the topic emerged. And in 2015, the UN Sustainable Development Goals were introduced. And the most relevant target for this topic became SDG 14.1 to reduce marine pollution. In Norway, a real wake-up call came when a whale stranded on a Norwegian beach in 2017. Upon death, more than 30 plastic bags, originating from, the from very many different parts of the world, were found in the whale's stomach. Norway already had a tradition for voluntary beach cleanups, but now a much greater part of the public took part in these efforts. It also initiated debates about unnecessary plastic products and ways to prevent marine litter. Um, it's safe to say that every country on earth has challenges when it comes to ensuring environmentally sound management of plastic waste. The um, in the SDG 12, the target four is responsible management of chemicals and waste. And in target five, the goal is to substantially reduce waste generation. It stresses prevention, reduction, reuse, and recycling. These targets have gained more attention as the discussion about the problem of marine litter has progressed. It seems impossible to address a problem without looking at its cause, and both the production of plastics and the production and use of chemicals are on the rise and expected to grow quite rapidly in all future projections that we have seen. A brief visit to Norway again. 
before I address some of the key concepts. Uh, back in 2017, the government presented a white paper to parliament that included a strategy for addressing marine plastic pollution and microplastics. This year, the government launched a revised plastic strategy as a follow-up. And this strategy takes a more comprehensive approach to plastics. It recognizes the need for applying a life cycle approach with an interventions in the design phase of products. The strategy also identifies uh, a number of important knowledge needs, including the need for better statistical data on plastic products on the market in Norway, on plastic waste and on plastic recycling. There are several agreements and conventions that we deal with addressing pollution of different kinds to air, soil, freshwater, and the marine environment. This make a, makes a general definition of pollution demanding, uh, but UN data has defined it as a presence of substances whose nature, location, and quantity produces undesirable environmental effects or activity that generates pollutants. The United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, the UNCLOS, um, in paragraph 43 calls for the prevention, reduction, and control of pollution. The London Convention deals with marine pollution as well, and in their definition of pollution, it includes waste and other matter. In my view, the international dialogue indicates a wish for a broad concept that can cover all aspects related to negative environmental impact along the life cycle of plastic. So the question is if the concept pollution can carry this weight. In addition to pollution, many concepts have been used to describe larger fragments of plastic. The term litter is not used in any conventions that I am aware of, but it seems to be a pre precise description of displaced, mismanaged waste. The concept debris was used in the first junior year resolution and in SGD 14.1. But debris is not the easiest term to define. The concept litter has been used in all the relevant junior year resolutions. Uh, the International Maritime Organization uses the concept garbage in MARPOL 5. Waste is also a concept used in the junior year resolutions and defined in the Basel Convention in brief, as substances or objects which are disposed of or are intended to be disposed of. As our knowledge of the sources, pathways and impacts have progressed, most recently through the UNEP 2021 report uh, with the global assessment of marine litter and plastic pollution, our understanding of the problem we need to address has become more comprehensive. Starting from the visible plastic litter in the ocean and on our beaches, we have gained knowledge that plastic pollution has more widespread consequences for the environment and that a more systematic approach is needed. The work on strengthening the global knowledge base has confirmed that microplastics and chemicals as additives in plastic products is a matter of concern, but it's much less visible than entangled animals or plastic litter on our beaches. The leakage of microplastics and chemicals from plastics can take place during production, their use, and not only after they have been discarded. So when it comes to choosing the right concepts to address the environmental problem at hand, will most of the invisible pollution from microplastics and chemicals also be addressed as long as we start dealing with the visible problems? This piece of art is chosen to illustrate that microplastics have been recorded in 12 out of 25 important fish species globally. And the chemicals that go along with it causes concern for both animal health and human health. I have spent some time on the concept of pollution, but what about prevention? Can we address this pro problem at the core? Or do, do we all run around and try to mend an ever-increasing problem of visible and invisible leakage into the environment? The proposed resolution by Peru and Rwanda is to agree on a negotiating committee for an agreement with an aim to prevent and reduce 
plastic pollution in the environment. Plastic pollution is an obstacle to achieve sustainable development. Status quo comes with a colossal cost for climate and environment. It also comes with a high social and economic cost. This illustration is not depicting a circular economy where resources are reused, but it's a typical life cycle of a plastic product in today's world. In my opinion, it's a visual argument to closely consider if use is necessary in the first place. In the EU and Norway, the waste hierarchy uh, should um, guide action. The new guidance on public procurement in Norway requests the procurer to ask the fundamental question, is the use really necessary in the first place? It seems impossible to turn the plastic tide if these sort of questions are left out of the discussion. Plastic pollution must be addressed from many angles at the same time. As a memory list for a hierarchy, one could consider to refuse avoid uh, if there's a more climate and environmentally friendly alternative material, if it's possible to reuse, or if it is recycled or possible to recycled. I have summed up my per personal memory list with it, which is to consider refuse, replace, reuse, and recycle. UNIPAS as a follow-up to the resolution from UNIA 4 on addressing single-use plastic products pollution, produced guidance on the issue, and re relevant advice to policymakers on how to avoid, phase out, unnecessary and problematic use of plastic. So, summing up, the elephant in the room used to be that we didn't talk about the need to reduce or use and dependence on plastics. As many countries have demonstrated, it is possible to ban the use of certain unnecessary products. It's possible to minimize the risk of pollution by addressing the design phase and using more recycled material. The severity of this environmental problem is hard to overlook. If the global community reaches an agreement that in effect reduces plastic pollution, it will contribute positively to reducing the severity of the three global threats the UN has identified. By addressing plastic pollution at all stages of the life cycle of a product, we not only address the pollution crisis, but we can achieve positive climate effects and reduce the severity of the nature biodiversity crisis. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Celia, for sharing those uh, considerations. And I particularly like the highlights of the visible and invisible aspects of the problem at hand. Let me now turn to our third uh, speaker. But before I do that, a gentle reminder that you may all send in questions and comments to the various speakers in the chat box. It has been quite quiet this far into the webinar. So I give you a strong encouragement and uh, share your questions and, and comments. And then I will turn to, to Eirik Lindeberg, who is the Global Plastics Manager at the WWF. WWF is the largest environmental organization in the world, I guess, with national representation in some hundred uh, countries. And uh, Eirik leads the WWF network on a global plastics uh, treaty. And uh, Eirik has been following this discussion over, over the years as well, and to see how the understanding has developed of these various uh, concepts. So uh, Eirik, I invite you to share some considerations on what you consider is necessary success criteria for a new global agreement. The floor is yours. Thank you uh, so much, uh, Ingeborg, and uh, also thanks to uh, uh, both previous speakers for some uh, really uh, interesting and useful observations. Um, I think we've, uh, we're all gathered here because we uh, are of the uh, joint perception that uh, plastic pollution is uh, a global problem uh, and it's global in so many different ways. Uh, plastic pollution, well, pl the, the, the production of virgin plastic material happens in some countries, 
and that virgin plastics is traded that it's turned into designed in some country turned into products uh, traded with other countries ends up uh, in and consumed in some countries and sometimes even the waste management is happening uh, in yet other countries and finally when plastic pollution um, when plastics become pollution and enters into the environment uh, it is uh, circulated and, tr and sh transported across borders by ocean currents and by river systems and even now as we see uh, more worrying new evidence of uh, transported as airborne microplastics as well. Uh, so in order to tackle such a complex uh, global issue that also is is happening in all countries in the world, there's no country in the world that uh, uh, can say that they are perfectly managing uh, plastics and have a circular full circular economy in plastics yet. So in order to to tackle such a problem, uh, uh, we need a comprehensive and holistic approach at the global level. Uh, and that's why it is so encouraging uh, for WWF and, and others that care about the global environment to see that the great movement that is uh, uh, building around the world for a new binding global agreement on plastic pollution. 153 countries have, according to our data uh, to date, uh, committed to work for a new global treaty on plastic pollution. Um, that is uh, huge. Uh, I think that is uh, also uh, uh, not common to have that kind of strong global commitment even before uh, a formal decision on negotiation uh, mandate has been, uh, has been made. And as you can see, the, uh, the support for this comes from all regions of the world and all uh, countries positioned in all parts of the uh, plastics life cycle as well. So the uh, time ahead is crucial and it's crucial that we, uh, that we design, develop, a new international legally binding agreement that really solves the problem at hand. Uh, what we will all discuss and negotiate hopefully over the next couple of years uh, will have precedence for uh, our ability to solve this problem for uh, a long time uh, in the future. Um, we have uh, set out some categories of uh, uh, elements that uh, uh, based on other environmental agreements uh, have been uh, successful. Um, we, uh, uh, we think that a, global, uh, a new global treaty can set uh, the important joint global goal that all countries are, are uh, agreeing to and gathering around uh, and the related national uh, targets and the requirement for national action plans so that all countries are are taking action uh, um, according to uh, global guidelines in their own country. Um, and then we think it's crucial that the uh, treaty establishes a global architecture to uh, coordinate, report and review to make sure that uh, we all know if we're heading in the right direction, to make sure that we have the data needed at the global level and don't have to lean only on uh, on uh, uh, estimates done, done by a, a couple of academics, but that we actually have a global proper uh, system for sharing uh, knowledge uh, and data. Um, then we think that we need to base all our decisions going forward on the best available science. So. Uh, an inter intergovernmental panel of experts should also be part of the treaty. But then it's uh, also crucial, and I think number four here is probably the uh, most important uh, category, because we don't want to uh, repeat the mistakes that we've said, seen in, uh, on other environmental issues. For example, uh, the big challenges uh, we're seeing with the Paris Agreement 
where we have a global goal and we have a, a requirement for countries to uh, deliver their national action plans of sorts, but that the action when added up is not enough uh, to reach the target and we're rapidly heading in the wrong direction. We really need to make sure that a new treaty on plastic pollution don't lead to that uh, same trajectory. And therefore, uh, we believe it is really crucial that the treaty also uh, put in place global standards and regulations on high risk products, disposal methods, whether that is um, uh, whether that is uh, uh, design requirements, standards for, for use of recycled content, uh, um, global bans on some of the uh, materials that I think most countries can already agree that is completely unnecessary and creates an unnecessary large problems. Um, and finally, I think that a, a treaty needs the uh, supporting infrastructure, uh, both in terms of uh, uh, financial support and technology support and capacity. Win WWF, we uh, have recently uh, looked at and done an analysis based on previous environmental agreements and to see what uh, are there some commonalities of those agreements that have succeeded um, in solving a, a global, uh, both environmental, but we also looked at at other areas uh, for global cooperation. Uh, and we have uh, identified some. Um, first of all, it is, of course, uh, important that the new structure is legally binding so that it is anchored at the highest possible level. What we really see with many voluntary approaches is that they kind of die out and fizzle out over time. There isn't that uh, uh, commitment in place for uh, governments to, to follow it up in the long run. We need a lasting structure here. Then uh, successful treaties are often specific about, about what states uh, must do. They include uh, uh, quite clear common rules, harmonized rules. Uh, so that there isn't there isn't too much doubt left and too much uh, uncertainty about uh, the framework. Uh, then successful uh, treaties also uh, have the ability to change over time. We know that we will get more knowledge about plastic pollution in the future. Uh, our understanding will increase, and a treaty should therefore have the ability uh, provisions to add whether it's protocols or annexes or or what it's called these should be uh, thought of already from the start of negotiations um, of how that process will be and make sure that we can uh, continuously strengthen the framework as we learn more uh, fourthly uh, participation and uh, compliance is important and uh, I touched on it uh, already in terms of the uh, support needed in order to uh, in order to implement uh, the provisions of the agreement in all countries um, and the need need for a, a proper system for participation and compliance and I think there's a lot of things to to learn here from other uh, agreements for example the Basel Convention and finally the fifth point uh, might uh, sound a bit uh, simplistic, uh, but it is actually quite complex. Uh, the new uh, Treaty on Plastic Pollution must be ambitious. What do we mean by that? Uh, it is not enough to set an uh, unrealistically ambitious goal, global goal and then uh, not have in place the measures needed in order to reach that goal. So the ambition must not only be expressed in the vision, but it, it, the whole framework must uh, be designed in a way that, that uh, makes sense in order to reach that goal. And we believe that there's actually, that this is really crucial also uh, for the new treaty to be um, 
to be legitimate and to be accepted among uh, the global public as well, because it is uh, it is uh, dangerous in the long run to to promise or always promise way more than what uh, is actually achieved to uh, uh, through an agreement. So it's important that the rules are not um, and and common regulations are are not only driven by uh, the least common denominators, but that uh, it uh, ambitious is is constantly growing and that we have the necessary measures in place to, to reach that. So that leads us to the important decision that will be uh, uh, made at uh, UNEA in February. Uh, the momentum is there. Uh, the unity among uh, governments uh, in the world seem to be there. Uh, we now hope that uh, uh, these uh, negotiations can, can really um, uh, deliver the results that, that seem, to me at least, quite obvious at the moment that we get a negotiation uh, mandate at UNEA that uh, allows for the negotiations of uh, the ambitious binding global treaty uh, that we need in order to tackle plastic pollution. It is definitely uh, possible. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much, uh, Eirik, and also for sharing that uh, image of a good memory when we could all be meeting together in one same meeting room to discuss. That uh, seems like a very distant past these days. Let me now turn to our final speaker, who is Ambrogio Miserotti from the Ellen MacArthur Foundation. Uh, he's a senior policy officer and works on the uh, efforts to accelerate the transition to a circular economy. And in, in partnership with UNEP, the Ellen MacArthur Foundation has been leading on the global commitment for a new plastics economy and bringing together many important stakeholders from business and industry. So, Amro, I will now pass the floor to you to share how this is seen from the business and industry community. You have the floor, please. Thank you very much. Let me try to share my screen now. I hope you can see the presentation. And, and also, thank you very much for giving um, a first overview on what the Ellen MacArthur Foundation is and what the Ellen MacArthur Foundation does. So as the title of, of the, the, the presentation uh, says, I really would like to focus on the private sector engagement and the transition from voluntary commitments toward the, the call for a UN treaty on, on plastic and on plastic pollution. Now, as you said, the Ellen MacArthur Foundation is uh, working on, a, on an initiative, which is the global commitment um, on, on plastics, uh, which is led together with the United Nations Environment Programme. And this is really where I would like to start the presentation today, uh, bringing the key learnings from the previous years and the key learnings from the, the data that we were able to gather across the network and the business signatories. So, as I said, the, the global commitment is now, um, we, we just released the third annual report. So. Uh, after the after the launch in 2018, now we have three progress reports that really start to show a trajectory of the improvements uh, and and the the path for the the pathway towards achieving the target set by 2025. So the report was really launched a few weeks ago in, uh, in November 2021, and uh, there are some key aspects and key points that I will share with you. But first, I would like to go back to 2020, so two years ago. Um, because there we already started seeing the first trajectory. So that was the second report. And it was clear that um, we had to call stronger on businesses to take bold actions on packaging types that are not recyclable today. And at the same time, set ambitious reduction targets. And basically over the past months, we have been working together with the business network. And uh, we raised the bar of uh, the commitments of the business signatory. That now also has a reduction target, uh, whether it's on the absolute plastic reduction or whether it's on virgin plastic reduction. And so going back to the discussion before, this is also looking at uh, preventing plastic to be placed in the market in the first place. And then at the same time, we also called on governments to basically look at two main measures uh, back in 2020. One was to establish policies and mechanisms for stable funding for recycling. And this, for example, uh, is through extended producer responsibility program. And another one uh, was to uh, shift the focus to an international framework for action for a circular economy for plastics. 
Um, and just to mention, over the past months, we, um, so the LMA Foundation, together with the network, published a report on extended producer responsibility, laying out the necessary role that extended producer responsibility schemes play in providing dedicated, ongoing, and sufficient funding for the circulation of packaging and packaging material. And then uh, we started also working on uh, a global agreement and this international framework for action. And, and I, I will get back to this point later on, of course, as this is the core of the discussion today. Now, if I look at the 2021 uh, key learnings, so these learnings really come after the call to action of 2020 and the learnings from uh, the action taken over the past months, we see three main uh, key takeaways uh, that I really would like to share with you. The first one is that after decades of growth, virgin plastic use appears to have peaked for global commitment uh, brands and retailers, and is set to fall faster by 2025, and also thanks to the reduction target that now all the signatories had to set in place uh, until 2025. The second one is that if we look at the targets for 2025, uh, we see that there has been progress, but that this progress has been largely driven by recycling. And this is clearly not enough to solve the plastic pollution. Much more focus must urgently uh, go and needs to be put on eliminating single-use packaging and uh, innovating into a um, new business model, new packaging and new products. And then the third one, which is also extremely important, especially given the conversation we're having today, is that a large, large number of businesses and countries, countries as uh, Eric said before, uh, from the plastic navigator of WWF, so a large number of businesses and countries are supportive of, of a global agreement on plastic pollution, recognizing that voluntary initiatives alone will not be enough. And this is really the, the link uh, between the voluntary experience also of the global commitment and the call for a UN treaty uh, addressing plastic and plastic pollution. So from the experience of the global commitment, uh, last year we started working with WWF and the Boston Consulting Group, and we released uh, together a report uh, laying out the business case for a UN treaty on plastic pollution. And starting from this report, uh, we also created a business manifesto, a manifesto that basically led to the business call for a UN treaty on plastic pollution. So up to date, there are more than 90 um, organi companies, organizations that joined the business call for a UN treaty. And these basically are companies throughout the entire plastic value chain, starting from converters and producers, brand owners, retailers, uh, waste management companies, as well as other stakeholders that are really engaged uh, in the plastic topic. But then um, this year, we also decided to expand the support uh, for a business call for a UN treaty. And we decided to expand the support to also financial institutions. And today we have uh, more than 25 financial institutions that joined the call. And these um, organizations represent more than $5 trillion of asset under management. So we really see that there is a strong understanding from the business community as well, that there is the need for an international framework for a global treaty that really addresses and bring harmonization, uh, globally speaking, uh, to address plastic pollution uh, once for all. And if we look at the text of the business call, basically um, we see that the business recognize that there is need for a coordinated international response, as I said, but that this uh, coordinated response need to bring uh, harmonize regulatory standards, you need to mandate the development of national targets and action plan, define common metrics and methodologies, support innovation and infrastructure. So really to create a level playing field, globally speaking, to facilitate uh, the way we address the issue, uh, like an, um, on, on a global level. Now, what's next, you may ask, uh, of the interaction between the, 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 the business community and the business network, and what does it mean uh, with, the, with this momentum building onto UNEA 5.2 in February next year. So basically, we're of course, working with the network that uh, was created on the business call. We're working with the manifesto signatories on a new statement because we really need to strengthen the message and the need for an ambitious treaty based on a circular economy approach. And it is this ambitious treaty that brings back the uh, focus on 
not just waste management challenges only, but at the entire life cycle of plastics. And this is where basically circular economy could, could bring in a comprehensive and systemic approach to address all the stages upstream, downstream, from the production to the use, to the waste management uh, when, it, when, it, when it happens, when, when waste <laughs> is created. And uh, again, the business imperative is clear, and this is really um, what I would like to share uh, with this presentation, is that the business imperative is clear. We must work together to solve this problem, and therefore there is this call from the business community to urge UN member states to commence negotiations on a treaty on plastic pollution and how this treaty would look like. Basically, uh, I think that the three speakers before me really provided a comprehensive understanding on what we should be looking at and uh, what will be the success criteria um, for, for UNEA when, when UNEA will take place next year in 2022. So this was uh, in briefly what has happened from the voluntary initiatives to the business call for a legally binding UN treaty. Um, and I'm more than happy to uh, keep the conversation going if there, are, there is any question, and I'm happy to answer um, in the body. So back to you. Let me stop sharing. Thank you so much, Ambrocio, for sharing this very uh, promising development of the engagement from the business and private sector and a truly impressive number that you, you have managed to gather together. And of course, the business community will play an essential role in implementing some of the efforts that we're trying to, to get in a new global agreement as well. So collaboration is definitely uh, something that is fully required. Uh, we have some nine minutes left of uh, today's webinar. I have received uh, two questions uh, for Karen that I would like to start off with. And the first one is uh, strongly related to the intervention by, by Ambrogio and now on how a new global agreement can contribute to more sustainable plastics value chains globally. And the second question, if you would also like to answer how this issue of additives in plastics could be regulated in a new global agreement versus the existing agreements that we have, such as the Basel Convention and the, and the Stockholm Convention. So for a brief uh, reply from you, Karen, you have the floor. A brief, okay. Um, I, I, I truly believe, and we suggested this in the Nordic report um, with some methods of achieving it, that to get a sustainable value chain at the global level, we really need um, global sustainability criteria. And long-term, the only way to fix this is going to be by designing products um, correctly so that we have less extraction of natural resources, we have less um, abrasion during use and release of chemicals. And then we also have improved um, outcomes at the end of life um, for the products. Um, so I truly think we have to really start working on some sustainability criteria uh, that can be used as a tool by governments to regulate the products that go onto their markets, um, either through banning or other market-based instruments um, using these sustainability criteria for products that don't meet those criteria um, strictly. So I hope that answers the first question. And then second question to the additives. Um, there's research that's been done that shows uh, there's about just over 10,000 additives for plastics that are used in plastics. Um, uh, just over about two and a half thousand of those are chemicals of concern or substances of concern. And um, only about 136 of those are regulated at the international level um, of those substances of concern. Um, eight of those under the Montreal Protocol and um, a few of them, about 128 or so, under the Stockholm and Rotterdam conventions. So that leaves us with nearly two and a half thousand that are, are not regulated at the international level that are substances of concern. So this is something that the, uh, the new agreement should be addressing. Um, obviously there's, there's over 8,000 chemicals that are regarded as safe for plastics at the moment, um, but as, as science um, comes out, we, we often find that maybe they're not as safe. So I think um, there's lessons we can learn from the Montreal Protocol and the Stockholm in the sense. So uh, obviously the Montreal provides a model for phasing out chemicals that we no longer want to include. Um, and then the Stockholm also 
uh, restricts some of them through the production phase, but then also at the end of life and when they may potentially be recycled and, and returned into the economy. So there's some, some measures in those that we could uh, learn from and include. Um, so uh, I guess the Basel Convention uh, deals with hazardous substances, uh, but the trade more so, but also the waste the, or reducing the waste generation uh, of those hazardous substances. Most of the plastics, uh, I guess, will fall under other wastes at this point, and we have the new amendments which, which deal with those. Um, but then we have criteria under which some of them could be classified as hazardous. So um, I guess we need to complement the, the Basel, Stockholm, Rotterdam and Montreal Protocol and cover those that are not covered by those agreements in the new agreement. That answer briefly. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Karen, a, a good and, and brief answer. And uh, that gives me the opportunity to advertise a little for the webinar planned for the 27th of January that will address the um, sustainability criteria and a very exciting report that's currently being prepared by the Norwegian Institute for Water Research. So that's definitely something to build on when we reconvene in January. I see that there is also a number of other very relevant questions in the chat box that are, are coming up that will be covered by some of the other webinars in this series. But I have one question for Eirik, if you're still with us, and that uh, relates to uh, the development of a new global agreement and uh, what the major challenges are to the adoption of a successful treaty. So that's a, a big question, but you have a few minutes to answer. You have the floor. I wish I could answer that one in a few minutes, um, but uh, I think, I, I mean, there are, of course, many uh, challenges ahead, especially when we know the scale of the problem and problem and how ambitious we, we have to be uh, in terms of designing uh, of policy measures. I think uh, um, I'm glad to see the great global momentum for this, so I'm, I'm uh, uh, I don't think we'll have a, a kind of a stall in negotiations from the beginning. Uh, but of course, there are there are chan challenges with solving any kind of global issue with this like this. There are vested interests in the uh, in the status quo. Uh, we'll always have that kind of bias where when those benefiting from status quo will already have a strong voice, but those benefiting from that. Uh, a circular no leakage economy that we create in the future are still don't have that uh, that uh, uh, kind of voice uh, so i think that will be a, a big challenge uh, it it will be a, a, an important challenge to make sure that all perspectives uh, from different stakeholders uh, from marginalized communities from from developing countries are properly heard in the negotiations um and uh, there's still a lot of uh, what I think is interesting work to be done on the development and understanding of uh, which types of mechanisms, which type of regulations will be uh, most efficient. And there, I think we have a lot to, uh, to learn from previous experiences, and then we'll have to be creative in designing this in, in a way uh, so that we can solve the plastic pollution problem. The biggest challenge of them all is that we don't have a lot of time. Uh, we know that the plastic pollution problem is already much larger than uh, we could have hoped for. The consequences are already way too big. So I think uh, maybe that is the largest challenge is to make sure that we manage to do all of this uh, in time and, and create that lasting structure that can help us uh, solve this problem for the next uh, century. Thank you very much, Eric, for that uh, good answer and very encouragement at the end of your intervention. And it is true, we have spent some time learning about this issue and building our knowledge and identifying the solutions. And hopefully now we are ready to take the next step at UNIA 5.2. Uh, our time is unfortunately up today, but I have noted that there is a uh, growing understanding of plastic pollution as being more than just the litter that is visible on our beaches and in the oceans, to also include the invisible aspects of uh, plastic pollution, notably 
emissions of microplastics to other environmental media, but the ocean, and also the issue of nanoplastics and chemical leakage from plastics. And uh, a very good answer from Karen there, uh, with the large number of substances that are currently not uh, un regulated and that we need more knowledge on what is actually in the plastics and what is in the products that we have on our markets. And also the very strong support that we have from the business community in developing this global agreement is very encouraging. We have the next uh, meeting of this webinar taking place already on the 16th of December, where we will discuss the uh, issue of national action plans that has been identified by many as an important measure in a new global agreement. We have also seen a number of countries developing various action plans over the past few years and that UNEP has been given a mandate from UNEA to also support countries in their efforts to develop these uh, action plans. So um, I would like to thank you all for following us today and look forward to continuing our very good discussions on the 16th and a, a general thank you for all of those who engaged in the chat box with a very good a number of questions that hopefully will also inform some of the discussions that we'll have later on in the year so um i just want to wish you all an excellent rest of the day evening night and see you all on december 16th bye bye